Entergy is proud to support programming on LPB and greener practices that preserve Louisiana. The goal of our environmental and sustainability initiatives really is to ensure that our kids and future generations can be left with a cleaner planet. Additional support provided by the Fred B. and Ruth B. Ziegler Foundation and the Ziegler Art Museum located in Jennings City Hall. The museum focuses on emerging Louisiana artists and is an historical and cultural center for Southwest Louisiana. And the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting with support from viewers like you. We want to work with our community to make sure those things happen. Orleans Parish elects the first black woman as sheriff. Stress over time becomes a health issue. COVID exhaustion leading to increased mental health issues. My message is to not give up. A Louisiana psychologist uses music to promote healing. This was started to really encourage um, Baton Rouge to be a regional destination. Red Stick Revelry's New Year's Eve in Baton Rouge. Hi everyone, I'm Kara St. Cyr. And I'm Andre Morrow. Louisiana is seeing a 60% increase in COVID-19 cases and hospitalizations over the last week. This as the new Omicron variant surges. The State Department of Health has adjusted their recommendations for staying safe this holiday season. They recommend mask wearing indoors and frequent testing, regardless of your vaccination status. There's no widespread mask mandate in Louisiana currently, but Governor John Bell Edwards did extend Louisiana's public health emergency order. The order gives all state government agencies the ability to mandate masks. State agencies within the governor's cabinet will begin requiring employees and visitors to wear a face covering. And health officials continue to emphasize the safety of the vaccine and booster for preventing the spread of COVID-19. And now to other news headlines across our state. In a speech on Tuesday afternoon, President Joe Biden announced major changes to his COVID-19 winter plan, which will now include 500 million free rapid tests for Americans, increased support of hospitals under strain, and redoubling of vaccination and boosting efforts. The Biden administration will also establish new testing sites and use the Defense Production Act to help manufacture more tests. The first new federally supported testing site will open in New York this week. Congressman Troy Carter concluded his first installment of his district-wide Building a Better Louisiana Infrastructure Tour this week. It's in his area around New Orleans. During his four events, he highlighted an expected $7 billion in investments from the bipartisan infrastructure law, with more than $330 million in his congressional district for road and bridge projects. The infrastructure law will also provide $110 million in annual funding for the Minority Business Development Agency through the year 2025. Orleans Parish District Attorney Jason Williams will launch a review of all cases prosecuted by Lafayette City Court Judge Michelle Odenet while she worked in New Orleans in the mid-1990s. Judge Odenet is on unpaid suspension due to a viral video in which she can be heard shouting a racial slur about a black burglar. The state Supreme Court appointed Vanessa Harris as Judge Pro Tem through February 28th to replace Odinette. New Orleans Mayor LaToya Cantrell announced an expansion of the citywide COVID-19 proof of vaccination mandate to include children ages five and up. Starting January 3rd, children will be required to show proof that they've received at least one dose of the vaccine or recent negative test results to be granted entry into restaurants or other venues. By February, two doses will be required. New Orleans parade routes are changing for the 2022 Mardi Gras season. Parades will roll on their traditional day, but crews have been asked to make route adjustments because of limited staffing from fire, police, medical, and other safety personnel. Mardi Gras day is March 1st, but parades will roll several weeks before that.
As we enter a third year of the pandemic, the United States has experienced a widespread increase in mental illness. In Louisiana, mental health experts are seeing a surge in patients suffering from anxiety and depression. Dr. Jan Laughinghouse, the executive director of Capital Area Human Services, says this is all a part of COVID exhaustion. Louisiana entered and exited four waves of the pandemic over the course of two years, with the last one peaking in September. But with each wave comes another consequence, surges in mental illness. Jan Laughinghouse, the executive director of Capital Area Human Services, says the back-to-back -back waves of COVID are triggering mental health episodes in Louisianians. I would definitely say we have had a lot of utilization of our uh, Louisiana Spirit Crisis Counseling Program. Laughinghouse says her agency is seeing an increase in people suffering from mental illness. She says the pandemic has exacerbated already existing issues for some and created problems for others. Since the initial outbreak in March 2020, anxiety, depression, and instances of substance abuse have surged. The Kaiser Family Foundation, a nonprofit mental health advocacy group, reported that 32.5 percent of adults in Louisiana were suffering from mental illnesses in 2020. The year before that, that number was only 21.2 percent. You know, stress over time becomes a health issue. And so we have folks right now who are mentally, so mentally exhausted that it's beginning to impact them negatively physically. You know, we're, re we're releasing stress hormones when we have stress that's sustained over time. When our fight or flight reaction stays heightened all the time, we actually have changes in our brain. And so we have this pandemic that has been ongoing and when we turn around, every time we turn around with these waves, there doesn't appear to be an end to it. And so people have no relief. What Laughing House is describing isn't unique to Louisiana. Depression and anxiety is up nationwide. In a public poll conducted by the American Psychiatric Association last October, 62 percent of participants reported feeling more anxious than they had been the year before, which is a big hike compared to the normal range of these reports, which usually sits somewhere between 32 and 39 percent. 2021 mental health trends are showing the same concerning data. This year, the CDC reported that during August 2020 and February 2021, the percentage of adults with symptoms of anxiety or depressive disorder during the past seven days increased from 36.4 percent to 41.5 percent. Now that the Omicron variant is the most prominent strain, Laughing House expects more people to experience anxiety. I think some people are already there and, you know, Omicron got them to this level and they're only this high. Data and surveys show that mental illness is currently affecting women and people without a college education at a much higher rate. Young people, specifically teenage girls, are also highly affected. The U.S. Surgeon General Dr. Vivek Murthy released findings that show suicide attempts for teenage girls increased 51 percent from 2019 to now. There isn't one particular reason for the uptick. But Laughing House says the information overload can be part of the blame. People are just trying to find an outlet. They're trying to find things to quiet their mind, uh, particularly when there is a barrage of um, news. And, you know, we can get in those 24-hour news cycles and people just don't get a break from all of the information. There are other pandemic-related factors that contribute to mental illness. The CDC says grief and fear, isolation, and lack of access to resources are all contributors. Laughing House says that turning off unnecessary notifications about the virus and connecting with family can help those struggling. But ultimately, reaching out to a professional is the best route to take. Experts recommend meditation, connecting with family the safest way you can, and following CDC guidelines to help manage any feelings of anxiety. History was made in Orleans Parish as Susan Hudson takes the sheriff's seat. Only 2% of sheriffs in the United States are female, and Hudson is the first woman to be elected as sheriff for her district. She's also the first progressive. During December 11th's election, Hudson took 53% of the vote and upset Marlon Gussman, who's held the title for nearly 20 years. I sat down with the new sheriff to talk policy and the future of Orleans Parish policing. So you upset Marlon Gussman, who has been in the sheriff position since 2004 which is a big feat. Why do you think the election was turned in your favor? 
uh, it was time for change. Uh, we talked about that from the very beginning. Um, we talked about now's the time to correct the failings of our criminal justice system. And um, this city had voted for change in other elections as well. So we knew that um, the time was now to, to move this last critical piece. Um, and so uh, the voters voted for change. I knew that at the primary when 52% said they wanted a new sheriff, yeah, we were gonna get this done. You've been kind of labeled as a progressive sheriff. What does that mean and also is that how you intend to serve? I embraced it wholeheartedly and I did my homework on it when I decided to get into this race. I started looking at what are, what's going on around the country. Um, and I spoke to a couple of uh, camps that of, sh of progressive sheriffs, people who ran on a progressive platform around the country. And I spoke to three other wardens who had implemented progressive uh, platforms in their institutions. And it just made sense to me, uh, everything that they were saying. Um, and that helped us to develop our message, uh, which was about taking care of those who are in custody, number one, taking care of those who work there, number two, and then listening to our community. Um, that's what it looked like. And so I absolutely embrace that. On your website, there are three main goals that you have outlined, and that is care, custody, and control. Can you tell me what those mean and how you plan to implement them? We know that 80% of the people who come into the jail either have a substance addiction and or a mental health diagnosis. So we know that we need to care for them better while they're in there and then when they leave we can't let them just drop. So what's happening right now is they get in there we know that the, the sheriff got into a consent decree or got under federal control because the medical and mental health care was unconstitutional. So they weren't getting the proper care in the jail. So we know we have to change that. But on this progressive platform, we know that if we do a public health model where we treat people in the jail, but we make sure that they can stay with those doctors when they leave, um, then we don't drop them, right? We, there's a better chance that they won't come back if they're getting the care that they need. So care, um, but care included a bunch of other things. Uh, my campaign manager and I were taking pictures one day and a man pulled up in a car, hopped out and he said, are you that lady running for sheriff? I was like, yeah. He said, well, you gotta do something about the food in there. They don't feed us properly. We're eating Lunchables and all kinds of uh, food that is not um, designed to get you at your best, right? We know that if we eat properly, drink water, do the things that we need to do, we will operate mentally and physically better. Um, but that's not happening in the jail right now. So we knew that. So we knew that th that type of care had to change. And we knew that people weren't getting the, there was some education there for a certain age group, like up to 26 years of age with the Travis Hill School, but everybody else is on their own. And we know that there have, has been a deficit of education in our community. So we know that we need education. We need that, we know we need training. We need opportunities. Uh, and most importantly, we need hope. Uh, so we talked to everybody who agreed with that, um, and a lot of people said they wanted to be a part of it. Another one of your goals is to reduce the number of people coming into prisons, because as you know, Louisiana has been labeled as the prison capital of the world, That's not right. the country, but the entire world. How do you plan on reducing the number of inmates coming in? We don't have enough deputies to, um, take, to keep this current population secure. So that means we have to bring it down or we've got to bring up the number of deputies. Most likely, we're gonna bring the population down before we're gonna be able to train, uh, to recruit, hire, and train new deputies. So we have to be very careful about who's in there. And we only need to keep people in there who make us unsafe. So if you're doing some, if fines and fees, we don't have enough room for that. It is a crisis in the jail. When we have one or two deputies on a floor by themselves, that's a crisis, that's unsafe. It's unsafe for those who are in custody, it's unsafe for those who work there. So. Uh, we got to work with all those uh, other actors to to keep us safe. And so we want to do that. You know, in Jefferson Parish, for instance, they have a very small jail. And one of the standing orders they've had for years between the judiciary and the sheriff is that uh, when it gets too full, the sheriff can release people according to a schedule and a type of crime. And so that's what we want to do here as well. Um, and now we have a pandemic as well, which means we have to segregate people so we need space in that jail to keep people safe uh, from the virus as well. Um, so we can only, again, have those who make us unsafe. Uh, and everybody else, we gotta find a way to get them out of that jail, especially those who are just in there because they can't afford bail.
We've talked a lot about people that are inside the parish prison system, and we haven't spoken a lot about what goes on on the outside. So the public's relationship with law enforcement, like I said earlier, has been a bit rocky. And do you think that your time here is gonna change that? Uh, we have to have community-led policing where we listen to the community's priorities, not so much we let them pick from some policing priorities, but we listen to the community's priorities and we act on those. So they say they don't feel safe in some areas. So we've gotta make sure that they, we have that presence to make sure they're safe. But that doesn't mean we're gonna stop and frisk. And that doesn't mean we're gonna alienate the rest of the community doing stuff like that, which has hurt policing over the last uh, 17 years I've been in the business of overseeing uh, police. So we wanna do uh, policing work that fits our community, keeps people safe, uh, does not bring, keep funneling people into the system who should not be there. Um, and so, and people have a right to be safe and secure from the government as well. So we want to be pinpointed in how we use our policing powers, uh, fair, professional, and constitutional. Well, thank you so much for taking the time out to talk to me. Thank you, Cara. All right. Hudson steps into her new role as sheriff on May 2nd. Dr. Katie Fetzer has branched out since we last talked with her here on LPB. In addition to her work as a therapist, she's become a singer-songwriter under the name Lukell. I talked with her about her personal struggles and trauma that led her down this new path and also the meaning behind her music. What I want people to know about me as a songwriter is that my entire lived experience is all that I am, all that I know, all that I've been through is poured into my music. Dr. Katie Fetzer is a Baton Rouge psychologist, but as you can see in this YouTube video, there's a whole other career of possibilities she's trying out. She grew up in a family of musicians and songwriters, but it wasn't until a series of events happened in recent years that enabled her to reconnect with her own musical side. I was working um, in a hospital setting and was actually assaulted by a patient. Um, and then shortly after that, I witnessed a suicide firsthand. Um, and then shortly after that, I, you know, you could say I was at the wrong place at the wrong time. I actually like to say I was at the right place at the right time. Uh, shortly after that, it was about 10 a.m. on a Sunday. My husband and I were making cinnamon rolls and we had a shooting that occurred in our, in our front lawn that ended up in a suicide. A lot of those things just started to take its toll on me and I realized, you know, that it was important that I did the right things to take care of myself. And in that um, healing process, I discovered myself as an artist and music became something that was really healing for me. Break me. Make me. This piano became a centerpiece of the healing. One night I just sat at it and I felt kind of invited to play and um, came up with a little something. I thought it was horrible. I didn't know what I was doing, but you know, eventually had some, some encouragement on the outside from others that said, keep going, you know, it sounds good. Uh, and my heart kept pulling me towards it, so, so it I listened. Just, it wasn't just the piano, it was also your voice uh, that, <laughs> oh, led, yes. that led yes. to uh, yes, that's true. I did sing. Yes. this uh, single that we're listening to. Yeah, seeing. absolutely, yes. Once I went through therapy and worked on myself and took care of myself, I started to really learn what it meant to listen to your heart and to follow the path that is laid out before you and really to discover my authentic self. And so it became, I don't want to say easy because this was filled with hard moments and it was a, you know, I went through a lot of hard struggle, but it did, it became more natural for me to say like, oh, my heart's nudging me here. Let me try it out. And once I stepped out of my comfort zone, my comfort zone just got bigger. And so what I realized was my heart was telling me that I wanted to sing these songs that I was writing. I was coming up with the lyrics. They were coming out of my heart from, you know, client experiences or my own experiences. And um, I realized that I didn't want anyone else singing them at this point in my journey. Maybe that will change. So, <laughs> you know, like if Paul McCartney or somebody's listening, <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I certainly would be open to that. But I just realized that I wanted the opportunity to sing my own songs. And I met a producer at the right time and a songwriting coach at the right time. And they said, well, just, this, you just do it. You just show up and let's see where this goes. And that's when they said, you have a voice and you can do this. And I just had the encouragement and I just decided to do it. 
Uh, I'm kind of taking it one day of time and just seeing where it goes, but I certainly felt the desire and the wish and I had the opportunity to be able to invest in this art that I'm doing. No different than buying a canvas and paint and new paint brushes, new guitar strings. Um, I'm doing these at little bitty chunks at a time when my heart feel, tells me it feels right while also trying to be realistic and logical. Do you know why being in touch with this has been part of your healing? Oh, that's a great question. I do. I think that it's funny because I have a PhD in counseling and so psychologically I could give you those like explanations why, you know, struggle and trauma can sometimes tap into the creative parts of the brain and they can be, you know, but for me, I really feel like it came at a time when I was ready and willing to be open to a spiritual experience because music for me is very spiritual. And so it was me really surrendering to something bigger than me. It's not about just me. I mean, it's about a message that I want to send, um, a healing message that I hope to send to hurting people in this world. And I feel like for me, it, once I surrendered to that, um, it became just something that kind of naturally is flowing out of me. I feel more like an instrument myself than anything else. And the message is? That to not give up on any, no matter what your struggle is, especially with my first single, Fly on Faith, those lyrics were written about um, abused children that I've worked with who wanna hide in their closet because they're stuck in abusive homes. And what can you tell them? I mean, I mean I'm in the hospital with them basically begging, I'm not begging, but I mean trying and using very evidence-based cognitive tools to teach them so that they can learn to not wanna surrender to suicide and kill themselves. And so my message is to not give up and to, to endure and look at struggle as an invitation to growing and to finding your authentic self and to seeking help. No matter how many times you know it takes to looking struggle as an invitation to healing. You gotta just keep on living. And it's nice to see how she incorporates music into the healing process. New Year's Eve in Louisiana just offers a handful of places where you can celebrate it, actually less than a handful. Natchitoches has its Festival of Lights, which goes throughout the holiday season. New Orleans has its own version of a ball drop, but Baton Rouge has Red Stick Revelry, which is a New Year's Eve destination. So to talk about that, Rana Gray, marketing guru, founder of Red Stick Revelry, and also Paula Rigo, who heads up CEO of Visit Baton Rouge. First of all, let's talk about the latest COVID and Omicron information that may impact New Year's Eve? Well, Andre, we would encourage everyone to follow the governor's guidance on um, public health of any kind. We're confident because we're an outdoor activity. Certainly we encourage people to wear masks if they're more comfortable doing that, uh, but we can be outdoors and you can, it, we have such so much going on, you can keep your distance, you don't have to be in the crowd. Sure. But uh, it's a great opportunity to get back and put this year behind us and look <laughs> forward to the next year. It is, and there are a lot of really spectacle events that happen with this. There's a laser light show that happens throughout the evening, uh, bands and, and all of that. Where is this taking place for people that don't know in downtown Baton Rouge? Well, actually, it's what we would call Rora Square, which is the area right by the, uh, the, the stage, North Boulevard, downtown Baton Rouge, and it's exciting. Uh, we're hoping that we can bring back the crowds that we had prior to the situation that we have now. And I think of significance at midnight starts the 50th anniversary of Visit Baton Rouge as an organization. Oh. So 2022 will be 50 and we'll be kicking it off <laughs> with Red Stick Revelry. Great, great. Good for 50. Tell me about it. <laughs> Not bad at all. And uh, this is year number nine for Red Ninth Stick Revelry. Ninth year for Red Stick Revelry. Of course, I was there right. at the beginning, That's but right. uh, I almost lose count. But tell us what's new this year about it and um, different from years past. Well, for someone who hasn't come before, it's, um, it's a wonderful evening of live music, laser light show, fireworks at midnight. We actually start it at 11 o'clock in the morning from 11 to 12.30 and have a children's event so children can have their own uh, New Year's Eve, that's, Eve experience. That's the Red Stick Rising, Red Stick Rising. which is the, the Red Stick Rising 
a town to sit 60 feet square. above town square yeah. until for 12 hours until midnight when it'll drop and then our activities start at 8 p.m. as Paul was explaining in Aurora Plaza and um, if you have been before it's all new yes we've got two new bands two all new laser light shows so whether you've been or you haven't been it's, it's a new experience and it's a great one uh, we have a new presenting sponsor bank plus that's allowed us to do some really fun new things and make this event better than it's ever been before so the new year's eve event begins at eight o'clock is that correct eight, 8 p.m. 8 p.m. and you've got the bands, the playing, the, the mayor is there, a lot of dignitaries, we have um, press and the one, countdown, of course. We have press one for English, the first band, then we'll have a laser, we have two laser light shows, okay. we'll have a laser light show, then we'll bring the Michael Foster Project, both of these bands very popular in this region, and then we'll have a second laser light show about 11.20, and then uh, they last about 20 minutes, and about 11.40, the excitement will be building, the crowds, as Paul mentioned there, at dinner they start coming out, you've been there, yep. they, they flood into the streets and uh, the mayor leads the countdown, Mayor Broom will be there uh, to lead the countdown and it'll, it'll be a great night. Yeah, it, it truly is and, and again, this is Louisiana state capital so why not celebrate it here in, in Baton Rouge? Great energy, a lot of fun. Um, right. I'll be there uh, getting to MC it again. That'll be fun. So look forward to it. And um, again, it's one week from tonight. Right. So right. And Andre, New Year's Eve. This was started to really encourage um, Baton Rouge to be a regional destination. And our hotels work really hard to um, roll out the red carpet not just for visitors and they do but local yeah. residents who sometimes want to just stay down there it's on a Friday night this year yeah. so stay over spend the night downtown you don't have to worry about driving home you can enjoy the fireworks at midnight you can uh, have a few spirits and yeah, not have to worry about like driving the next <laughs> that's right thank you all for being here appreciate oh, it thank, thank you. you thank you for everything you do Red Stick Revelry begins at 8 p.m. New Year's Eve. That's in downtown Baton Rouge on North Boulevard at Davis Roar Square. And everyone, that is our show for this week. Remember, you can watch anything LPB anytime, wherever you are, with our LPB PBS app. You can catch LPB news and public affairs shows, as well as other Louisiana programs you've come to enjoy over the years. And please like us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. For everyone here at Louisiana Public Broadcasting, I'm Andre Morrow. And I'm Kara St. Cyr. Happy holidays, everyone. Until next time, that's the state we're in. Entergy is proud to support programming on LPB and greener practices that preserve Louisiana. The goal of our environmental and sustainability initiatives really is to ensure that our kids and future generations can be left with a cleaner planet. Additional support provided by the Fred B. and Ruth B. Ziegler Foundation and the Ziegler Art Museum located in Jennings City Hall. The museum focuses on emerging Louisiana artists and is an historical and cultural center for Southwest Louisiana. And the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting with support from viewers like you.